Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Caldoun Swice for Logically Faithful. Uh, today's topic and our consideration today is, are the stories in the Bible real or did they really happen? I am proud to have with me today, Bill Harville. Bill is a brilliant presenter and a Catholic in tradition, uh, Christian, and a position that he holds very strongly and is able to articulate in a way that's persuasive and gather a lot of support online. Well, some opposition as well. <laughs> Anytime you speak the truth, <laughs> that would happen. Or, uh, Bill considers himself a fellow inmate in the worldwide hospice, lovable but dying. He says he was uh, blessed to work for 21 years in the Archdiocese of Miami, excuse me, serving as a Bible teacher, campus minister for Florida International University and Miami-Dade College, liturgical coordinator, leadership formation director for the Youth and Youth Adult Organization for All Saints Catholic Church in Sunrise. He was director of religious education in a parish in Pompano Beach. Among wearing other hats, Bill is behind the brilliant Bible Alive presentations. Thank you, sir. Happy to have him with me, who has done over 850 videos and more are coming. Right, Bill? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate Good it. Good to have you with me. It's an honor, sir. Sincerely, you're so kind. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I've been following you for a while now. Uh, that's the recommendation of some of my friends, um, because you call into question some of the presuppositions many uh, Christians, specifically those in the fundamentalist sphere or evangelical sphere, or even traditional sphere within the Catholic tradition, yeah. have um, uh, taken for granted, such as the historicity or the interpretation of or the way we see metaphor or analogy in the Bible is actually historical rather than metaphorical. Um, can you touch base on some of the background you have in coming to this and tell us a little bit about where you're coming from as we approach this question? Thank you, Professor. Sure. Um, I'm a recovering fundamentalist. Um, uh, you know, when you have a powerful experience with Christ in a desperate time, in a hard time, a formative time uh, of your life, you go into that romance sometimes pretty strong. Mm. And it's a lot of flame. And maybe there's a lot of mental gymnastics instead of reasoning to, to bolster and, and, and undergird the, where you are and where you're going. And sometimes a lot of that is ego defense. And sometimes there's good in it. But it, 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 it's, it's an alloy made of many things, some not so good, uh, some dross that gets in there and is presented as gold. And so I, I had that experience and through a lot of falling on my face, uh, learning about things in difficult ways, mm -hmm. uh, being very lucky, being very lucky, I was able to move gradually beyond that and, and, and see it in a way now fundamentalism in general, specifically fundam Catholic fundamentalism, right? In particular for me, um, uh, as having problems. And uh, it was a necessary stage in my life. I'm not, I'm not hateful of it, you know, but it was something that I don't think anybody should stay at forever. Mm -hmm. um, the difference, which we maybe can talk about later, one of the differences being, you know, like what, what's reasonable and what's rational or rationalistic. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I can see that within the scientific tradition where people go into scientism rather than understanding science itself, right? Which is a happen. big distinction important to, to make. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, so let's let's take a look at that. So a lot of the, the over 850 videos that you've done one of the main themes in there is to question the presuppositions of people coming to the biblical stories, right? Yeah. Uh, what are some of those themes that you're trying to unpack or uncover or um, unveil as you're going through all these and continuing to work on this? Yeah, that's a great question. A great point, uh, uh, maybe direction uh, to, to understand one another. Um, so, so one of the things would definitely be the understanding that the word of God doesn't necessarily mean God's words dictated mm -hmm. and presented as marching orders. Mm 
deontological marching orders that everybody at every time has to follow and fulfill. Uh, another one would be, what is inspiration? It's not clean and, and, and pristine, chemically isolated from culture or history, that it's a messy business, inspiration. So the emphasis of the importance of the prefix in for the words inspiration and incarnation and what that entails. So those are two, two things, uh, points of departure. Inspiration, okay. Um, inspiration, you didn't say indoctrination, you talked about incarnation. Incarnation, incarnation. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get into this. Let's get, let's, uh, yeah. let's get some fireworks moving here. For sure. So can you share any reasons you have for embracing the Christian faith that go beyond religious experience? or the epiphenomenal um, sure. eating with God, so to speak? Are there basically any evidential reasons that you have for your faith as opposed to being a Buddhist or a Mormon or a Muslim? Right. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, um, so, so this gets into the whole thing about the difference or the distinction between reason and just uh, things that you can prove by reasoning or rationalizing alone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could tell you that my mother loved me. My mother passed away in 1998. Mm. I can't really give you a chemical uh, materialistic evidence. I can't, I can't put that to you and say, well, see, here's the proof. I can show you a snapshot of my life today, but maybe I got here, many people are, are almost 50 years old like I am, and they haven't experienced love. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's love there. I believe God loves all things. But I'm talking about my mother's love. How would I prove that to you? Mm. You'd have to get to know me. You'd have to experience me. We'd have to be in a relationship, a friendship, where we journey, and I could tell you about my mother uh indirectly i could show you these things these things could be revealed as i learn about you and you learn about me as friends as brothers we journey along and that might get picked up it might not but it might get picked up it's not unreal i'm a living testimony to it and there are many things like that in life and in the faith uh that where we've been impacted by a whole nexus, a whole web work of experiences that are reasons to believe. Mm -hmm. they, they give me uh, like a diving board in which I can make that leap of faith continually deeper and deeper into light. So what are some of these top what, uh, two or three reasons that you find the Christian faith or Christ himself to be more attractive than any others? Okay, so here, here's how I approach it. I, I, I'm, I'm less and less competitive mm -hmm. with our tradition, and I mean as a fellow Christian, with Christianity as compared to Islam, as compared to atheism, as compared to Jainism, as compared to Buddhism, whatever. It's not that I'm lining things up going, well, okay, I'm, I'm checking off what, what passes the test for truth. Ding! I won the Super Bowl. My tradition wins, all right? It's not so much that as it is. It starts off with the journey that I happen to be born into a family, which is more congenial to the Christian tradition being where I am in the United States. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that my father was a lapsed Baptist, mm -hmm. despite the fact that my mother was a lapsed Catholic, mm -hmm. I'm still very close to the Christian traditions of those traditions and lines. I was you know, two steps away from a church experience with my friends and with uh, uh, relatives at all times in my life. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to dismiss that. Had I been born in a Muslim country and wasn't part of a Christian tradition in those countries, because I know Christians exist in those countries, and a lot of people don't, but they do, and other other walks, um, if, I was, if I was born in... Uh, a Buddhist family in a country that was surrounded by Buddhism and soaked in Buddhism, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to be a Christian as easily as I am in the situation I am. So it's more congenial to my historical experience. I don't want to 
undercut that or pretend like I'm just, we're walking around completely isolated from these experiences and we all, you know, truth gets presented to us and we do all the work as if like Rowdy Zacharias presents it, Dr. Scott Hahn on the Catholic side presents it, as if you could arrive at the baptismal font or at the, at the altar call without any uh, gift of God in our own personal family history. I mean, that's just not, that's not how God works. Okay. So that gets into the prefix in. Okay. God was working with me in my situation. I'm not judging other people that don't have that situation, right. but he made it so, God made it so that I was able to make that leap and, and has provided me with and continues to provide me with the opportunities to continue to make that leap. And I'm never without freedom. I can say no. Mm -hmm. So and sometimes we all say no. It's a journey. Mm -hmm. Even after we have this fundamental experience. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the evidence. I think it's part of the evidence. Other evidence, yes. I mean, I, I haven't been presented with things that make our fundamental tenets of Christianity absurd. Okay. So I don't see Christianity and what it proposes, if properly understood, and by that I mean the five main traditions of Christianity, including Protestant Protestantism. So it's something we all share, right, as Christians. Right. The Christian faith, as you put it. I don't see anything there that is against reason in what, what is proposed. And maybe you could give, if you want us to go specific, you could propose, Professor, a, a specific. Well, one of the major dictums of the faith is mentioned by the Apostle Paul himself, that if Christ had not been raised, Right. Eat, drink and be merry. You know, go get drunk, hang out, just right. enjoy life. Hedonism or nihilism. Um, so he's putting his cloak, so to speak, the cloak That's of right. his faith, the centerpiece of the religion, on the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from That's the right. dead. Absolutely. Right. Resurrection would be very specific. Yeah. Um, and, and there are many, you know, Christian apologists who just go to town on that. Yeah, I've yeah. work myself on the on the uh, resurrection. So uh, would that be one of the pillars that you would hold on to? Oh, absolutely. The resurrection is essential to Christianity. Having said that, I don't necessarily view resurrection as something provable like William Lane Craig does, Harry, uh, Garagou Lagrange back in uh, right. earlier times did. Um, it, it, is, it is reasonable. It is not absurd to believe in. Yeah. And it is al also fundamental. Yeah, it's it's foundational to us. We're a resurrection people, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that's where the whole tradition of Easter comes in, right? Right. Other and I would say the name. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. And then there's all that that whole topic. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. Uh, the very foundation of the Christian faith is on the resurrection, but uh, that leads us to some fascinating discussions we could get into here on the metaphysics of this. Sure. Right. Okay. So, in your opinion, uh, opinion, excuse me, is there sufficient evidence? of understanding the Christian faith without a deep understanding of the cultural world of the Bible? It's uh, a great question. Question a little bit more. I'm, I'm, my family's from the Middle East. We're from Jordan. Right. And I see a lot of illusions and, and uh, metaphors in the scripture that I just relate to so well. Sure. They're completely over my head. That's why I'm right. Like, what? What are you talking about? Exactly. That's that's a gift. But but there's... there's um. Uh, the aseity or the perspicuity, excuse me, of the scriptures, which is a, a doctrine of, of theology, which claims that the Bible, if read clearly and without any um, you know, yeah. major presuppositional baggage, which is almost impossible, um, right. you could actually see what God's telling us and come to a conclusion yourself. But according to the videos you presented and some of the arguments, you say, no, then how can one understand the Bible without understanding its cultural context? It's, I completely stand on that. And as, as a Catholic fundamentalist back in 2000, 2001, absorbing the Scott Hahn stuff, right? Absorbing the Catholic answer stuff because I'm being attacked by evangelicals who were ex-Catholic, Latino, Latina ex-Catholics where right. I live in South Florida. You know, I'm not like defending myself, defending my ego project. And mm -hmm. 
I'm investing in like, well, let me get my biblical proof texts. And yeah, at that time, it looked so clear. It, everything pointed to the Catholic tradition. What are you guys thinking? And then you begin to see, no, no, that's something we all do. We bring our own baggage, and that does shape how we interpret things. Okay. So I think we were talking sometime, you and I, about the three umpires. Mm. Remember that, right? For your for your audience, right? Yes. The three umpires. I know three umpires, right? The first umpire, the second umpire, and the third umpire. The first umpire says, I call them as they are. Second umpire says, they're nothing until I call them. Mm -hmm. And the third umpire says, well, I call them as I see them. Mm. So these three umpires are like the three ways people look at the scriptures. Well, yeah. Okay. Go on. Uh, this More is or less. Right. This is an epistemological view of how to, how to view those. Yeah. Exactly. Epistemological. The first guy, I like to call him Mel. The first umpire says, I call them as they are. Mm -hmm. There's no interpretation. It's just as it is, as he sees. Well, not as he sees it. He sees it exactly as it is. Six days of creation, etc. Precisely. That clearly, uh, Matthew 16, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. That's talking about the papacy in every single way. Can't you see that? Right? And there's a whole bunch like this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Romans road. Romans 1 through through through, uh, through 11. You have the whole thing. Romans 1 through 9, chapters 1 through 9. Or the way we do church, the book of Acts, if you're Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Or the dispensations mm -hmm. and how they are listed out. It's all there in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. We all have those proof texts. We all have those canons within the canons. We all have those uh, hermeneutical lenses through which we see things. I'm no different. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's pretty clear that it's not clear. It's pretty clear that, yeah, you 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 call them, but that's not necessarily as they are. Only a naive realist like the first umpire would be so arrogant to think that his call is exactly what is. Hmm. Uh, it takes some humility, some epistemological humility to say there's always more. There is yeah. something true in what we say when we go, well, you know, that moved me when I read that. And that's not invalid, but to say that that's universal and applicable to all peoples at all times, and that's exactly what was in the mind of the human author, was under the inspiration of God, mm -hmm. when he, and yes, it is a he, put it down, yeah. whoever that human author is, because that's the time and condition situation, and we're not women writers at the time, nothing against female writers. Uh, and by the way, that limits also his understanding of things, because now you're getting a male conditioned, culturally specific male who's at a historical point, that's what God is, that's who God is dancing with in this beautiful inspiration. Of course, that's going to muddle some things. It's going to limit what's being, we're not, we're not as Christians proclaiming what our Muslim brothers and sisters proclaim about the Quran with mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible's not the Quran. Mm -hmm. It's messy. Mm -hmm. Quran is possibly dictated, to those of you who don't know, to Muhammad directly by the angel, word for word. Exactly. That's what they believe. Right. And there's therefore no critical historical studies that could yet develop uh, in, in that Islamic tradition. Those at least who hold to that adherence. I know Muslims who, Islam is also a big tent. where You have a lot of different people thinking of many different things. Schools of thought in Islam, right? I'm sorry? Different schools of thought within Islam. Exactly. And also also among individual Muslims. When Muslims come to the West or they go different places, they expose themselves to different ways of looking at it, like everybody else. Same with us whenever we travel. Uh, but yeah, you don't have really... You have a variety of interpretations, of course, but you don't have one that says, this evolved. Like this text evolved. Like there was a gospel development. Stage one... What actually happened to Jesus and his followers and what they experienced. Right. Stage two, how they preached about it and talked about it. Stage three, how this was interpreted for situations in Jesus groups decades later, being given for sometimes very pastoral reasons. 
okay. but, but presented and reworked in a way that could be understood and accepted by the community, not to deceive, mm -hmm. but to help. So that's a, that's a development. When you look at Luke chapter one, verses one to four, he's saying he's in, he's in the third generation of people who have had, had the gospel handed on to him. In fact, he's in the fourth generation, Luke, if you think about it, mm. you know, uh, yeah. and those verses show that. So there's evidence too, like when you look at the difference between Mark uh, 8, which clearly Matthew 16 is dependent on, I'm talking as a Catholic now, you don't hear anything about thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Matthew has that. Now, is Matthew lying or fibbing? Or No, he's not lying or fibbing. He's expanding and, and, and explaining the truth that was true for his community, and he's not an American journalist. Okay. That doesn't make his truth untrue. Let's, let's take a look at the three empires, then. Let's, let's bring the conversation. Sure. So you have the first empires as I see it as it is, right? right. It's a naive realism, right? right? Okay. Um, and then... Uh, that would be like the examples you gave of the rock and of the six days creation that I talked about as well. Okay, so that's a, for one view of seeing the Bible. I just read it. Oh, that must be how it is. And then build a whole tradition and maybe even a church and a whole a right. good opposition about it. Right. right. And here we are. Okay, so, so go from there to, to number two now. Right. Uh, the empire. Tell us how he would see the Bible. Empire number two is very prevalent in a lot of Bible, so called Bible study prayer groups. To sit around in circles uh, with the hash brown casserole on the side. And what is this? Somebody reads the text and then says, what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? By the way, that's not unimportant. That's a beautiful thing too. But it can't be all it means. So the, the second umpire, right, says, they're nothing until I call them. The plays of baseball, you know, doesn't matter where the ball is. When I say it's a ball, it's a ball. Mm -hmm. When I say it's a strike, it's a strike. You know, it doesn't matter what these Bronze Age mythology stories meant way back when. It only matters how I interpret them to be today. Mm -hmm. In other words, every reader, the only context that matters is the context of the reader. Okay. Well, that's really problematic. It's a radical subjectivist. Really, really postmodern. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so looking at that second view then if the first one is a naive realist the second one is a naive personal um uh or a um uh, maybe a narcissist of some sort because I think they both can be view, they both the view. and everybody has their own view yeah yeah well i mean the first one also is a little bit of a solipsist okay he thinks what is objective is actually what is subjective the second person th says, well, the only thing that matters is what's subjective. They're actually not too far away from each other. Right. Right. But the other one denom dominates it. He says, this is the way it is. It was saying, right. I'm not saying that's how it is. I'm just saying this is the way it is for me. Right. Right. And that actually brings up an interesting concept, which I wanted to ask you about, is the concept of truth, which we talked about a little bit um, off, off show. So for our readers in, in, in philosophical uh, terminology, uh, we're talking about how we view the world and how the world actually is. There, there, there are two separate things, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, if I see a bus coming at me, I should get out of the way because I see a bus coming. Oh, no. <laughs> but right. the bus may not actually be there. I may just be in my mind, right? Sure. But nonetheless, just to be safe, I'll get out of the way. Right. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but to say that only truth is whatever I want it to be is also, like you said, problematic. Yeah. Um, that is a very postmodern relativistic way of seeing the sure. world, not only the Bible. So, which leads me to a side point. We'll come back to it. How do you define truth in its perspective? Is there something that could actually be known, whether you're reading the Bible, reading the newspaper, or talking to an individual? Yeah, all three, yes. It's something that could be known. Uh, most of it is what we encounter. Uh, which is what we're really talking about. And this is something I do retain from the classical Western metaphysical tradition. Truth is being known. Okay. So, you know, like the ancients said, um, verum, you know, um, ends at verum, confrontunter. Right. Being and truth are interchangeable. 
when the mind looks at, at, at what is, that is truth. The relationship between mind, the subject, and the truth or the being, that which is subject, you know, uh, substantial in and of itself, objective, if you want to say. Although a lot of what is objective or called objective is culturally tutored subjective. Right. And we see that in our experiments. We see that in many things. But, but I want to say this, though, just to add to that, because you asked a very important question. Can we come to know truth? We can, but we need to be humble and understand that life is full of mystery in the ancient Eastern sense of mystery, the Greek mysterion, initiation. You're always entering it. You know, I, I'm from a tradition that values the peasant girl, nothing person, Mary, Miriam. Okay, she knew her son very close. But I have to believe since her son is the living God, she's always getting to know him because God is holy and ineffable mystery, even revealed, even disclosed, even incarnated. He's a, he's There's yeah. always more. Eternal mystery, right? Eternal. Uh, but then that you said truth is being known or known and being known maybe in more detail. But is it possible for something to be true, meaning real, um, without me ever knowing or anyone ever knowing it, like at the bottom of the you know, 2,000 leagues below the sea? <laughs> or, um, I don't think so. Uh, in heaven. Um, like how many actual angels actually God created, right? right? We don't know that, but God knows it, of course. There's there's actually right. a number, of course, right. logically. Sure. I don't know it. Does that mean because I don't know anything about it that it's not true? Yeah, no, I think truth is by itself because I think I think that primordially being itself and what we're talking about is God, ultimately, existence itself is relational. And therefore, relation to be relational is to be self-disclosing so it seems that an essential quality of being since truth is an essential quality of being and good is by the way good is being loved desired delighted uh, um, but it's being right and beauty is the whole of this experience i know this is very classical western metaphysical right. transcendental stuff i don't want to leave it in the static though but what, what i was saying was that and where I want to go with this is, is that it's known in a mutable and corrigible way. It's not known exhaustively, ever. The moment you know it exhaustively, completely, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not God. By yeah. definition, God's inexhaustible. But, but, but to know that, let's say there's um, uh, parts of the remains of the Titanic still buried, right, below the specific. Um, no, they claim they got all the pieces. Well, no, there's possibly some that we miss. Sure. And, and there actually could still be there. It is true that they're there, but I will never know it. And no one else will ever do it. Sure. Is, is that true there? And then the reason I ask that, because it's important in a um, a religious context, um, there's a difference between, and I get into this a lot with my students, a belief in God and yeah. God. Amen. Yeah, huge. And theology of God and God, even a correct theology of God, which is what you're getting at, right? I believe right. in the, you know, God, the, the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And then we can ask a whole host of questions. What do you mean by God? What do right. you mean by almighty? Almighty, omnipotent. Oh yeah, that'll get us into that. So the question is basically is, can truth be independent of us as a race, as a people, as an individual? Uh, because I just saw this meme the other day. It says, um, uh, God, you know what's missing in the Bible? Comma, your opinion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I say, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, I'm not supposed to bring my own uh, eisegesis in scripture. But you cannot do that. You're going to have to. It's impossible to be not to do that. Right. So that, that's basically, you know, coming back around that question for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so we believe as Christians in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That seems to be our, or the answer that's been given us. That before any creation or creature, being ase is relational. Right. You have the the uh, eternal, uh, unsourced source that we call father or pater, patron, patros. Right. Who endlessly gives 
self donates in canonic emptying to an eternal recipient and an image the we call sun and this spirates eternally in this love and life that they share that's being and that's existence itself certainly the holy spirit and you got that dynamic that's incredible. right so there is truth goodness and beauty eternal mm -hmm. simply because being is that way okay now saying that having a philosophy <laughs> having a theology of that is infinitely mm -hmm. different than diving into that ocean than, than being complete in life with all my space and time fragmented pieces collected in all of the space and time fragmented pieces collected of all creation in the dance that is the Trinity. Oh my God. That's beyond all words, beyond all arguments. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's being, like you said beautifully, by the way, Professor, you said not just knowing, but being known. That's right. part of that relational. Yeah, that would be apply to God, but would that apply like for example, is God a Trinity? And we would agree from our tradition that yes, he is. But what if all of us decided, nah, we have come to the conclusion based on new councils that God's not a trinity, God's actually a Moad of some sort, you know, or a congregation. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, right. Um, it, it's possible we could be wrong about that. Then yeah. there is a truth independent of us, right? That's what I'm getting I think, at. I think, like I think the exists, Titanic pieces at the bottom of the ocean. I think existence is, and I think that tension, that tension, right, between we know this now we share this now we articulate it this way now but it falls short of what is and will always in some way ultimately fall short of what is that's what i'm talking about by the humility of it, understanding that it, our knowledge is mutable it's corrigible mutable it can change corrigible it can uh be improved and i have to at least be open to the i mean all christians catholics included believe that the, the, the essentials of what we call our faith have been disclosed in such a way that we have an assurance that this is how it is. But even in this, in these essentials, there still exists an ambiguity. There, there still exists questions. For some people, no. They're closed off to question. That's dangerous. Yes, the dogmatists as well as the relativists are both dangerous in their position, right? Umpire number one, umpire number two. We haven't got to three yet, but... No. Um, umpire one and two. So that goes back to that question that's very, very fascinating. Um, I would like to see how we could go into that in detail regarding the truth thing. I just want to... Yeah, know, yeah. Close the door on this one so we can move on to everything sure, else. Sure, 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 sure. I, I titled this video discussion, this interview with you now, as did the events in the Bible, mentioned in the Bible, actually happen? Right. right. And that that presupposes that there's a truth that we can actually know, which is a whole foundation behind the scientific enterprise. We assume there's something true in the world. We're going to go look it out and find out whether sure. there is fossil evidence, whether the global warming happened. We're going to assume whether there is, um, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, geographic uh, location of Jerusalem and Noah's flood, whatever it is. Right. We're assuming there's a truth outside of us. In your presentation of these, and some of the critics I came on this uh, that, that brought this up say, no, I don't think Bill Howell actually believes in truth. What okay. I would say, I would say, well, get to know me. Um, I might say this because I do this with my students once in a while. Mm -hmm. I, I ask the question, I play a little game with them. Okay. And I ask the question, um, what's more real, a rock or a mermaid? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I have them answer that. And I don't care what you answer, just answer whatever you feel. I only ask that I'm going to ask that you do this to be consistent that when I ask the next few questions and only ask a few more okay. following on your first answer, that you're logically consistent with the answer you give. Whether it's about the mermaid. Yeah. Do you, what's more real, a rock or a mermaid? Are you asking me now? Was just a good Okay. Go. Yeah, I'll say rock. Okay. Why do you say rock? Because a rock has concrete existence in the natural world, and a mermaid does not. It has um, metaphysical or uh, allegorical existence in the literary world or mythological world. I like that. 
And when you say you come to know the rock through the natural world, how do you come to know it? That it's not something like the mermaid. Okay. Okay. So I like to describe a beautiful yeah. fundamental uh, difference, right? Uh, not only can I see, touch, and um, uh, whirl a rock and carry it, smell it, uh, use my five senses on it, but also it can be peer reviewed by a third party, given that I'm not delusional or taking hallucinogenic drugs of some sort. Uh, another party can actually verify, and that's why you have the whole study of geography. Right. Right. Um, I like where you're going with that because you also just evoke the relational that we share with each other in a community, that human existence is communitarian and trust is built in to that enterprise, right. that existence, right? Okay. A lot of people would say the rock through the senses. I know that. I don't doubt that because I've asked this to hundreds of people and I usually get the answer in our culture here in the States. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask, moving apart from your your beautiful answer. I'll ask the people who say the rock because of their sense experience. Um, okay, what's more real, a rock or justice? I remember I've asked for people to go consistent. Um, it, it seems on a uh, amateur level that a rock is more real. However, hitting someone with a rock uh, in an unfair way would be unjust. So that actually would invoke justice, which I can't taste, see, hear, or analyze. And certainly whether or not the real, I mean, a lot of people would say, hey, look, if you're consistent and you've answered the first question, well, I, I believe the rock because I can sense the rock, right? I can taste it, I can touch it, I can hear it, for thing it, you know, and so forth. Uh, well, I can't do that with justice. Mm -hmm. So that means the rock is more real than 6 million people exterminated being wrong. Mm -hmm. Because that's just opinion. Okay. okay, so we're materialists. Um, I've asked this question to a lot of people who are fundamentalist Christians. Okay. Who believe that God is a spirit who believe in supernatural order, believe in life after death. All right. The final question, what's more real, a rock or God? Those that are logically consistent that don't storm away from me say, well, since I've argued this way, I'm not talking about how you answer, Professor. But Right. right. Yeah, I'm not a typical. <laughs> yeah, because of my profession. I like, knew that. Uh, <laughs> You're rigorous in your thought and critical in your thinking. Uh, by the way, it gets to one of the one of the questions I'd love to talk to you about after we get over this. Sure. Uh, like, well, do we have a sufficient enough for sufficient? What does that mean, sufficient? Okay, but anyway, uh, for faith, the Christian faith, right? This understanding of culture in order to have a sufficient grasp of the faith, or to have the faith and know it in a sufficient way. Okay, well, you're if you if you say well from the rock to the justice is, is just opinion to God is less real than a rock. Well, you're an atheist, the more you're a nihilist. Mm. And the problem, th this isn't about God's existence. This is right. about what the problem, the fundamental problem with apologetics today. Okay. Neo-Orthodox apologetics tends to go blindly down this road, right? Because I can accept the authority of the Bible, Ravi Zechariah says, because... It lays out a prophetic record that I can clearly see and prove demonstrably. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Council of Orange, Second Council of Orange would condemn that idea that you can arrive at faith through reasoning powers alone as semi-Pelagian. Ravi Zechariah, rest in peace. John MacArthur, Scott Hahn, okay? I mean, and others. This idea that, okay, you know, well, Jesus is... The, I could take the Bible as an historical document that infallibly tells the truth. In the Bible, I encounter Matthew 16, where Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now I know the papacy is valid. Whoa, you've just made humongous leaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both the Protestant, neo-Orthodox, uh, small low, neo-Orthodox uh, apologists, and the Catholic neo-Orthodox apologists, it comes from a way of thought in the 19th century when we were Catholics and Protestants feeling stupid because we were pushed out of academia, we were pushed out of government, 
And now we had to justify ourselves. And isn't that interesting? That's the time when biblical inerrancy comes in and infallibility of the papacy comes in mm. at the same time. Mm. These are control. Lock it down. Got to control things. Some of it has some good in it because it's defending what you're trying to talk about, which is there is a, a, a substantial character to truth to, to what is irregardless of whether I accept it or not. There's a, there's right. Okay. Right. But if you push that aspect of meaning and truth too far, you're in idolatry. You're in mental gymnastics. You're really a scratch off atheist. But you're not saying, are you, that truth is, as Empire 2 would say, truth is what I want it to be or what I say it is. Like, no. God is what I say he is or she is or they are or whatever it is that people come up with. Right, right, like that. That's a, an aspect right there. And are we as people today, whatever the individual defines it, 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 itself, himself, herself? I mean, we can talk about that. Yeah, I, I don't think I think in some cases yes, but in in, in other in majority of cases, uh, especially when you involve others, no. But I, I, I'm curious. So then you would not say that truth is it, it would be only what I or what we perceive it to be, or is there something more to it? Is that would lead to there's empire? more to it, and that's why there's a third umpire. I think the third umpire is onto something, which is now, now let's talk truth. to him. There's right, there's goodness, there's truth and beauty in umpire number one. Okay. But it's messed up. There's a lot of other things. And in umpire number two, there's truth, goodness, and beauty. Right? Everybody has their own perspective, and that's important to come to the table with. Yes. Okay. Right. So umpire number three, right? I call them as I see them. Mm. This umpire has the insight to know that, yeah, the ball is where it is, irregardless of what I call it. It's in its proper zone or out of it. But you still need an umpire. Hmm. Still need an interpreter. Like you said earlier, we are never without the inter. All of us are still bringing our baggage and interpretation. And that's part of it. So the people who wrote scripture, right, are, are the inspired uh, men who wrote scripture. They experience holy and absolute mystery breaking into their lives. Other people were with them and didn't experience it the same way. Other people were with them and didn't experience it at all. Okay. Right. But they, did. they grappled to put it to words what they experienced. So umpire number three is the proper Bible reader who grapples to understand what exactly the reader, I'm sorry, what exactly the, the human author was trying to say the science of critical, I'm sorry the science of technical criticism would be that um, trying to find out what the original authors may have said given the multiplicity of documents i would i would hope that really the cultural critic because the historical critic if we go to the textual or this especially the historical critic hasn't produced in over 50 years what they set out to do they, they, they set out to give us a jesus that's very clear and it's been dead for 50 i'm not saying their tools are are, are bad Oh, they're wonderfully developed tools and we need them. We cannot pretend like they don't exist. But they have failed to do what the people who heralded them and developed them claimed they would be able to do. Okay. And cultural criticism has gotten us closer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. still in a mutable and corrigible way. And so in that sense, that leads to maybe the, the whole discussion about do we as 21st century Western people who have loads of leisure time in post-industrial situations, not everybody on earth, but you and I, and the people we interact with in our social circles, okay? Let's be honest, right? Do, do we, what is the importance or the import of, 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 of cultural criticism when it comes to approaching scripture? Yeah, it's, it's essential for us. So the average, person, the average person, the average farmer, the average, um, uh, blacksmith, whether you're talking about the, the, the 19th, 18th, 17th, 15th century, given that they're literate, and even today, the average engineer or the average um, CEO who picks up a Bible, can they come to a knowledge of God and a saving faith by reading the scriptures alone in their office or on the farm or in the coal mine? 
with a deep heart wanting to know the living God. Uh, 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 anybody in the, in the uh, pre-industrial situations you mentioned or pre-21st century situations, you said, absolutely can come to a saving life of God with or without a Bible in a community of human beings. Hmm. hmm. Okay. So it's possible. You're isolated on an island. I right. always use that example. God will meet them on the island because God's in all things. I'm not pantheist. I'm not a pantheist either. I'm just saying God is in all things. So sacramentally. There I am, incurably Catholic. There we go. Is it, all things are not God, but all things are from God, and therefore the universe, very Thomas Aquinas here, is like a sacramental mundi. It's 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 conveying God. I thank God for the Protestant witness that says, Yeah, yeah, but God is not creation. Amen. But there's no other way I can get to God except through my experience and my life through the creation. So there's a beautiful dance there in the two traditions. Right. Um, but yeah, so so God meets us. In the, that's Paul, right? In Romans. God meets us in all things. All It's established. It's there. Right. You know, um, and there's degrees to that knowing and intimacy. Mm -hmm. Right. The whole thing with the incarnation, hopefully, is somewhere where we can all come to experience that Christ life in ourselves. You know, I've heard it described as God the Father sends God the Son to give us the spirit of adoption. That in the spirit of adoption, we become conformed to the image of the Son for the glory of God the Father. Wonderfully said. It's an Exodus Redditor kind of schema. This is not one of the questions, but it's leading to that, which goes into the very definition of the inspiration of Scripture, which is which means God breathed, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So when God breathed into um, Moses uh, his inspired thoughts of how the world was created, which Moses obviously wasn't there, and he right. began to write it down, um, or when um, uh, when Moses was actually writing about the uh, killing of the Canaanites and the slaughter of their children, Malachites, and, uh, all those guys, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the doctrine of inspiration says that you know, the, the words are inspired by God for edification and salvation. But then we take it one other level with the doctrine of inerrancy, which is not only that, but every word that's out of the Bible is actually true in all areas, whether you talk about geography, physics, and politics. The Bible itself cannot err because God is a God of truth and he would never inspire somebody to say something false. Right. First Protestants didn't believe that. Catholics for fifth and Eastern Orthodox and ancient churches of the East didn't believe that for 14, 1500, 1600 years of church history did not have any understanding of the, or fallibility of a Pope, by the way, mm -hmm. or for 1600. Years. These are rationalistic ideas born and developed out of the arguments between Cajetan and Luther and the whole understanding in the West of the problem of the criterion. Mm. Where's your proof for this argument? What's your epistemological right. gas backing this up and taking your tank to where you need to go? Well, and then I got my thing, and then I got my thing, and then that goes and goes and goes, and then we got all our Western world. I had a Summa Theologica behind me. Right. I'll use that, right. Exactly, yeah. Right. I'll use it against Immanuel Kant. Wait a minute. Aquinas wasn't going against Immanuel Kant. He's not asking those questions, but that's sure what we, we did in the, in the 19th century. That's mm. what Catholics did. Okay. We made him super Aquinas. And yet the best part of Aquinas is his third period. The period where he was trying to finish this, this pile of straw, he called it. Mm. It's amazing, by the way. I would never throw it away in the fire, the Summa Theologia. Never. Yeah, but he threw it in the fire. Because that was his salvation. Mm. And he didn't talk anymore. He for a long time, brother, he he wasn't he didn't speak at all, and that was his self. Now, maybe because so much over ninety percent of Catholic doctrine from the Catholic tradition gets articulated through Aquinas. For a lot of Catholics, salvation got worked through the. Uh, and by the way, I have a, a different. And we're using these words, salvation, right? Faith that's salvific faith. What do we mean? Saved from what? Saved from hell? Right. Right. We mean healed, become fully human, or live your best life now. Or does it mean happiness, right? Or does it mean right. happy? What, right, a full right, right, right. And then that gets into a lot of muddy waters. 
But we have to look at that because, you know, we got to look at a lot of things here. Did Moses get inspired directly by God? Are we talking about Moses, the Yapiru warlord? Who well, maybe had uh, organized a marginalized group of Apiru that were working and didn't get paid right by, uh, and didn't look like, um, you know, Charlton Heston or Batman. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> maybe, and I love uh, Prince of Egypt because it's animated so beautiful. Oh, I love that one. That's They're beautiful. Favorite. Come on. Who doesn't? Uh, you gotta have a the Lion King. Those are two of my two pop favorites. Yeah. They're, I love the Lion King. Lion King is awesome. A lot of biblical and Shakespearean oh, stuff. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. But, you know, the story cooks, and that's also part of the inspiration. So you know, I was you, my son was asking me, did the events actually happen? Did the crucifixion actually happen? Did did Moses actually part the Dead Sea? So yeah, we're gonna be talking about that. Did did Jesus actually walk on water? Yeah. So those are you have unpacked a lot of this stuff in your videos and things of that nature. Yeah. How, how does that relate to this uh, conversation as we're talking to this? Like these little examples. Miracle, right? Yeah. I live in in, in uh, South Florida where Spanish is a second. I mean, it's like the first language for a lot of my brothers and sisters down here. Strong mm -hmm. Cuban community, uh, Colombianos, Venezuelanos, my brothers and sisters. You know, and mira miracle. You have that word mira, hmm. which means look. Right. And we translate the Aramaic and Greek for that in, in the New Testament as behold. Like nothing is so churchy in English as behold. But it's it's really look. Hine, look, look. Mira, look. Right. So it implies, right, right there, that's very different than the way we think about the word miracle today. We tend to use it as if it means post, it's a beautiful post-enlightenment word, what it's become. A violation in the physical laws governing the universe. Hume, right. Hume. That's exactly from David Hume. Well, here's the problem, right? Did ancient people have an idea that there were physical laws governing the universe? Obviously. They didn't. Well, they obviously knew that if they threw a rock, it would fall. They didn't know about the laws behind it. That's what. But I they mean, yeah. wouldn't think right. You're right about that. They did believe. They did see patterns of consistency. No. Yes. 100%. They didn't have the Newtonian laws, of course not. But that's. It's also different than laws. Like there are laws in impersonal causes. No, they mm -hmm. had no concept of impersonal causality. If a rock fell, it wasn't because it was obeying a law that God proposed. It uh -huh. fell because that's what it does. Yeah. It's consistency. And I know this because we know this also because we can look at other philosophers from other schools in Islamic traditions where you have this understanding that uh, things happen in the universe because God wills it all the time. It's like the universe is a magic trick that God is preserving all the time. It's not really that fire has property that will cause burns if I touch it you know, and encounter it. No, no, it happens because God wills it mm. just that way. So every effect has a personal cause. That's how the Bible is. There's no way to say in Hebrew, it rained. It's God sent the rains. Hmm. Mm. If you're going through a sickness, a person did that to you, the evil eye. Or if it's not a human person, it's a spirit, an spirit. other than human person. Everything was personified, pronosified, right? Or ethical modernized. So they had no concept of impersonal causality. Therefore, they had no concept of scientific laws governing the universe. And if you do not, if I don't have a concept of angle, mm -hmm. brother, how can I conceive of triangle? So if I don't have a concept of physical laws governing the universe, how can I have a concept of miracle? Mm -hmm. Violations or overriding physical laws governing the universe. So they didn't have that. They had the understanding of wonders, okay. marvels mighty deeds that no human could accomplish god had to accomplish that okay. he had to empower with the exousia the authority like what are they always asking about jesus nobody is doubting that jesus is going around healing people including his enemies by the way mm -hmm. nobody's doubting that but what they're asking is how the hell did this galilean hick this nothing person this day laborer how did he how is, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you the authority? Excusia. Mm. Well, it's either God 
or one of the lesser gods, the demons, the fallen ones, right? The <laughs> false ones. Right. So with that understood, there's marvels, wonders, dunamis, mighty deeds, uh, like dynamite, right? That's what they call it in the synoptic gospels. Right. Samia, signs, ta'urga, works. This is what the Bible talks about, not miracles. In English, whenever there's a, the word miracle in the Bible, that's 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 an anachronistic, ethnocentric. Place. I love how you're doing it. You're unpacking the presuppositions that we bring to the text as we read it and, and looking at it from the Near East point of view, ancient Near East. So, so with that said, when Matthew and Luke and, uh, are writing about the walk, Jesus walking on water, they thought they saw a ghost and they knew what that was apparently. But the, that story is so powerful and used in so many. Uh, portraits and pictures and and movies and um and, and, and inspirational talks do you think i mean if jesus was god obviously he would have the ability to walk on water but were they recording a historic event or the the feeding of the five thousand? when ancient people saw something that happened it happened they didn't question that it happened they didn't say let's test the science of, out yeah but they're also not people saying, wow, Jesus is about 180 pounds. He's displacing about 30 to 50 gallons of water with each foot step. He's defying the buoyancy force. So, you know, the story I gave on this, if you watch the video on, on the on the on the miracles and you've watched uh, the, the walking on the water. Not... OK, so right. So 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 actually we all walk on water. We do it every time it rains, mm. but we mm. don't walk on the sea. Mm. It's important to understand that in the for biblical people, the sea, Hayam, is not a what, but a who. Mm. So we're not even reading the story correctly because we're missing. Uh, we're missing. We're missing what's being com communicated. Okay. So he's walking on the Galilee. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Sea of but Galilee. These teenagers are fishing in the Jonah Zebedee fishing syndicate. Mm -hmm. They go out in those perilous waters with the squalls and have to get, and they're despised in their occupation, correct? These are lowly dirtbag people. They're not dirtbags. I love them. Okay. That's a good either. Donawin. Donawin, brother. All right. It's so easy to make the Virgin Mary into a Roman empress, into Galadriel. It's a completely different thing to say that a uh, illiterate Galilean peasant is the queen of heaven in Christ. Hmm. We've lost that. And we do the same thing with Jesus. It's easy to make Jesus into this, pardon my expression, badass American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super popular. Jesus Great wasn't looking. an American? <laughs> Don't you? I thought he was for a long time, right? <laughs> And, and 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 that's there we go. It's it's because we won't tolerate a Jesus that's not behaving like us, looking like us, that is not our idealized autobiography. All right, but getting to the miracle, right? right. So my two friends, right? I got these two friends, yes. and they're two really wonderful guys. Okay. One of them is named Stephen Colbert, hmm. and okay. the other is Ricky Gervais. Okay, Ricky Gervais. Now, yeah, both of them are nice. The both of them are good. Uh, both of them have a wicked sense of humor, and they both sit down and read this story that's in all, almost all the Gospels, right? Jesus walking on the sea with a capital S, right? And they read it. And Stephen, who's a catechist as well as a comedian, late night talk show host, he looks at it and goes, you know, this text is telling me that Jesus has the power to violate the buoyancy force. And I believe it. I believe he could, and I believe he did it. Ricky Gervais looks at it, reads the same story, and he reaches the same conclusion. He says, this story is telling me that Jesus has the power to violate the buoyancy force. Mm -hmm. And then he says, this is BS. Right. This is a crock. Mm -hmm. And he throws the Bible down. Because Ricky's an atheist. Good man, but an atheist. Yeah. You know what they both have in common? They're both reading it literally? They both read it wrong. Mm -hmm. And they're actually not reading it according to the literal sense, which is the intention the authors had in mind. They're reading it literally 
in the bad sense, as if it's a, a text written for, by, and about Americans. Post-industrial, post-enlightenment, with those categories. Okay. So now let's see what the story is actually saying. Mm -hmm. Jesus is walking on a personified sea, a demon. Because that's how the sea was perceived by ancient first century Mediterranean, circum-Mediterranean peoples, including Israelites. A, a being that in the hierarchy of beings, human beings have no control over. A tempestuous bipolar, for lack of, I'm, I'm projecting my own, obviously, that's a category for modern times and modern psychotherapy, Psycho, okay, psychiatry. But a, 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 a thing that's calm one moment, rageful the next, fishermen and peasants, much even emperors, <laughs> don't have any power over it. And Jesus is walking with his dung covered feet that are filthy and shameful to do this on this sea god, this sea demon. Mm. And they are seeing this. And what modern anthropologists and cognitive neuroscience would call an altered state of consciousness. Yes, I was gonna ask you about those because you have a lot reference a lot in your videos. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a whole thing that you discover through research. And it's not saying that what Jesus was doing was fake. It's not saying that the wonders of God are fake. Uh, it, it's not an atheistic, materialistic reading of altered states of consciousness as non-consensual reality or something that is pathological or something that is wrong, but rather God's preferred way of communicating God's self to human beings from Adam to Revelation. If you go through the Bible, God's preferred way of communicating lines up very well with what cognitive neuroscience and cultural anthropology show us about altered states of consciousness. There's about 35 plus 35 different states. We're in one right now. If I keep talking, you're going to nod. <laughs> We're going to do it. Your, our, your audience is going to be like, oh, God, please don't shut up. And that because because our brain resets, uh -huh. it, it, consciousness is not just this like constant thing till we go to sleep. It's actually very fluid. We daydream through most of an hour. We think we're so alert and so concentrating on something at work. No, actually, we're falling into all these different states. And there are some very um, interesting ones like sky journeys and ecstatic trance and visions and yeah it's interesting because uh, i must remember reading uh daniel dennett who's one of the premier philosophers on uh consciousness right. he says we have the illusion or the delusion that we have a cartesian theater in our mind that we can just revisit after an event happens right uh, not at that at all it's more like a flipping debating and coming back and forth of images back that we remember right. and we only focus on what we want to remember or what hurts us the most amen um, in that uh, but so then this when the disciples were in that boat and they saw jesus walking on water why is stephen colbert and ricky gervais or gervais wrong then in reading the story as jesus walking on water coming on a boat and they see right and he, he's walking on h2o because it it, it it should be it should be patently obvious why right first they don't conceive of h2o they don't conceive of buoyancy force they don't conceive of the way we do when something seems to defy a physical law governing the universe, I mean, if we saw that, what are we looking at? David Blaine? These are the categories we think in. Right, but you're talking about even fishermen like Peter obviously knew I can't walk on water. That's why he asked Jesus, here, call me if it's really you, right? But it's not just water, it's the sea. They're looking at, they're looking at in their symbolic universe, they're looking at this is a living uh, entity. Okay. I've got, you know, and again, this is another thing. We, we tend to think that these are monotheistic, good Jews. There's only one God in existence, like good Muslims and good Jews and good Christians believe. No, no, these are henotheistic Israelites. There's nothing Talmudic about their practice or their faith or their understanding. They believe in multiple beings. They worship only one God. That's henotheism. And Michael Heisman pointed that out, and he, he enlightened me and he was work on that. Yeah, multiple gods. Wild. That was a huge thing I learned from Dr. Pilch and others. What? What are you talking about? The Shema? 
the Shema, he immediately started coming out with the proof text. He said, oh yeah, the Shema, that's a perfect uh, henotheistic text. Mm. Hero, you know, and or, or the commandment, hero Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord, you know, uh, the Lord, your God. Mm. I'm not Chimash. That's the God of the Moabites. Mm. I'm not Baal. I'm okay. your God. I happen to be communion for you, the highest of the gods. But, and then whole understanding, you know, monotheism develops slowly. You know, when we say, when we read in, 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 in uh, Exodus, the, when the song of Miriam, right? God is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. In monotheism, true monotheism understood, philosophically rigorous, theologically rigorous, God can't be a warrior. God doesn't mm -hmm. fight wars. Well, who is there to fight? <laughs> God has existence itself. There, there are no other gods. Not right. In the Bible, when, when that statement is made, it's an honor statement. Nobody's at my level. Mm. Okay? It's different when we theologically have developed in the spirit. I believe that, you know, as it got understood, oh, yeah, there are no gods because God isn't even a god among gods or a being among beings. God is existence itself. See what I mean about mut in, in, in the mutable and corrigible. We had to keep going, even though this is our normative theological literature, the inspired right. scriptures, we still had to grow. We still have to, even now we have to grow. Uh, forgive me here, Bill, but um, what you're talking about here is profound. It's fascinating. It's interesting. Sure. I still see how, based on what you're saying, how Gervais or... okay. Right, they're right. actually got it wrong if they're talking about things, but they maybe they don't understand the cultural context. They, 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 they don't yeah. get what they're reading. They don't get what they're reading on a fundamental level because what they think they're reading is a story about how this person, Jesus, Ooh. is, I mean, for Colbert, I, if we've got a little bit deeper in it, he might be thinking, okay, you know, he's God, the son, second person of the Holy, of the most Holy Trinity, he can do whatever he wants. He can evaporate the Pacific Ocean with a thought. By the way, it's very docetic. Mm. It leaves out the humanity. Yes. I mean, is, is the divine way of knowing compatible with the human way of knowing? I mean, there's reasons why we Chal Chalcedon said what it said about not getting them mixed up. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's a starting point, not a finishing point in our understanding of Christology, the, the Chalcedonian compromise. But more to what you were saying, I, I want to stay on target here. Um... I thank you for getting me on target. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's the combination of the way it's perceived inevitably by Western people when they read a text. They're reading things into the text that don't belong. They're appropriate for our cultural setting, for Western Baltic personalities especially, who are the one culture on earth, according to cultural psychologist uh, Arthur Kleiman, that blocks ASCs unless they're under the influence or they're asleep. 80% of the world's cultures today regularly and routinely have these experiences. So yes, people at any time seeing people walk over a body of water would be like, whoa, this yeah. is something humans are not capable of doing. But there's a whole bunch of other things that are being communicated there we don't look at a body of water and go, that's a person. Mm -hmm. That's a demon. We don't. Mm -hmm. But the biblical authors who are writing the story down did. Mm -hmm. If it did happen with Jesus's followers, first of all, there's differences in the stories, by the way. So where did this experience actually happen? I mean, there's multiple attestation to it. I don't think we should doubt it. There are good reasons to think this was not a story done to kind of associate Jesus with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where God is dwelling over the face of the waters, and maybe this is some kind of fancy allegory saying Jesus is like that. Nor is it, a, according to the scholars I read, a resurrection experience that's been retrojected back into the actual ministerial story of Jesus. Okay. It probably was a real experience that they had. Maybe they were on a beach talking to Jesus, and they went into trance. Group trance does happen with people. And God used that to communicate that you should stick with Jesus because he's empowered to go beyond 
the demons. So when he proclaims Israelite theocracy, you should listen to him. That's powerful when you say yeah, God's more powerful than the storm or the demons of the storms. But what biblical text or, or Christian tradition uh, do you have or Jewish tradition that indicates that beings are like in the air? Or like the, the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. Right. Uh, demonic uh, reference there. But what reference do you have even in the nature in the Near East that called, wait a minute, I'm answering my own question, Neptune. In the Greek mythology, was the philosophy of the water, right? Right, riding on the waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's said, some truth there that would be filtered in. That, but there's something with Jesus. Nobody talked about a peasant doing that. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't read a Christological reading into that. I, I would read the understanding that, at least from the scholars I'm reading, okay, that this is saying that Jesus is empowered by God to be a holy man. And to overcome the problems that are faced by peasants, okay. the people who were primarily his audience, the okay. nobodies. Nobodies of the world, right? And who he makes sense. Not a we. Right. People like me and you. <laughs> you just... We all really are. That's what I mean by fellow dying inmates. We, we fellow really dying are... inmates. Yeah, I love how you put that. Right. From Father DeMello. And he's, he's, uh, but he, in a dark point of my life, brother. It helped block me out of that fundamentalism. I got a little bit of taste of the mystical. Mm. And that, the Bible wasn't written for fundamentalists by fundamentalists. I don't like a lot of what the Deuteronomic historian says, okay? I don't. I don't like the, the, the harem warfare, okay? I don't like, let's kill all the Amalekites, all right? Yeah, I don't think C.S. Lewis even thought that was a historical even author. Right, yeah. exactly. Him and Marcion of Sinope, the mm. most... That we have problems with Marcy, and we should, but he's right. the most influential Christian thinker. Well, not Christian, I want to say anybody who belongs to the body of Christ, yeah. he was the he is the most influential person of all time, more than yeah. Paul, more than more than Aquinas, more than Luther. It's because, and my proof for that is if you open up how and you ask Stan Lee and Jack Kirby of Marvel Comics, two secular Jews, how did you come up with Thor? And this is what Stan Lee says. And it's a page right out of Marcion of Sinope. Okay. Well, I wanted to do a story about an Old Testament God, Odin, and a New Testament God, Thor. Yeah. That's where I rest my case that Marcion is unfortunately the most single most influential person mm -hmm. the body of Christ has ever produced. The mm -hmm. Old Testament is last day's newspaper. The New Testament is today's newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole thing about... Uh, supersessionism and how we relate to Jewish people, which he didn't even intend. He was probably Israelite himself, a shipwright uh, in the Black Sea. But anyway, uh, going back to this, uh, yeah, you know, we're talking about this. This, so Jesus has that. Uh, he's in breaking. You know, there's no way they're going to follow a Galilean peasant, nothing person, shamed person who is a social deviant because as an artisan, he'd have to travel. If he's only making, you know, small wood carvings and, and uh, metal work and stone work, he's going to starve to death in Nazareth. So he's going to have to travel. Anybody who traveled in the ancient world that wasn't an elite was a social deviant. Fishermen are social deviants. They're probably teenagers. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, these are people suffering from massive malnutrition. We know that from the skeletons, the paleopathological remains. Get that idea of Jim Caviezel out of our heads. Hmm. He didn't look like that. He didn't look like the guy in the Chosen at all. Teeth rotting out of the head. We've never found a skull first century Palestine with a complete set of teeth. We know how people in these similar situations look today. Carbohydrate deficiency, protein deficiency, we, every comb we found at Murabit, at, at Masada, has had lice eggs, mm. parasites in the gut. Mm. Then you got violence. This is an agonistic culture where you shame somebody. Suddenly, you know, they're out to kill you and your family. So blood feud, and it's game over. And, and, and this is not in any way knocking any Middle East. Yeah, your, your, uh, one of your videos for me was uh, the one on divorce and marriage was a game changer. It really made a difference like what divorce and marriage actually meant during that time and more tribals. Not just a personal romantic me and you kind of Shakespearean tragedy. We are now, right, 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 right. 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 Uh, 
let's let's take this and make this practical because I have a other set of questions, but we're already sure. well an hour, Bill. Is that okay? Oh, if like, we, wait, please, please, please. If you're okay with it, I hope I'm not like yeah, yeah, I'd like to keep going here. Uh, Joe Rogan like goes on and on like three hours. <laughs> Although we do share a certain barber. Um, <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. You look sharp too, brother, like Joe. Like, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, that story you told with the widow, where Jesus um, tells us that as the widow gave of out of her poverty, she gave just one mite, and the others gave all this money, and it clashed hard into the 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 the, 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 the plate thingy, whatever it was called. Oh yeah. Um, that that she gave more than all of them, and you said our traditional understanding of that is wrong because we don't know the ancient Near East understanding of it, or the the the, um, the first. Or century. just following the text of Mark and the Synoptic Gospels. All right, tell us about the impact that for those of us who don't know about that, because I'd like to take a look at your thoughts on this and how the you know, the brilliance of that. Oh, thank you, brother. Well, it's it's all stuff from standing on the shoulders of scholars. I'm standing on the shoulders. When I first read this, is one of those ones you throw the Bible across the room. Mm -hmm. or you throw the commentary across that cannot be accurate but that's when yeah, you know you're on to something yeah. maybe it could be also it could be nonsense too but it's the same thing you might have something where you can grow from it right so this is a story comes from mark it's a triple tradition story right Matt, mark matthew and luke in the synoptics and it's right when jesus is going of course to the temple these are the last days of jesus right and he's not happy all right and in so he goes to the temple and he spends Mark 13, what they call the synoptic apocalypse. It's really a forecast. And, and, and uh, Jesus knows he's, he knows he's dying soon. And he has a, a, um, uh, a prescient way of ex people in this culture. They know when they're dying, they begin to tell you the forthcoming. So this is all going to happen. And of course, this is being written after the temple is destroyed, right? Or about the time that the temple is going to be destroyed in the case of Mark. Mm depending on when you date it. it could be 65 it could be seven somewhere between 65 and 75 so anyway he goes on and on and on about how the temple's heart you know this is this is you know it's all going to be destroyed right before that happens uh this old woman well we don't know that she's old she's a widow she has no voice in her society we can know that because when you look at the text it's we know what we know about the culture uh, if her if her son is dead, or her eldest son, she has no voice. She has no husband. Okay, she's she's really. It doesn't matter if she has a million ducats. She has a million denarii. She's still poor because here poor doesn't mean something economic. It means you can't defend your honor status. And honor is everything in this world. Honor and shame. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so she takes now. Right before she's introduced to the story, Jesus talks about how, what, what is making up the temple, right? Uh, the people who are rapacious, they're robbers, they're taking and draining the economic surround of all the peasantry, and uh, they're, they're doing it, and, and this is absolutely horrific. So if I'm reading that just the way it is, it's like Jesus wouldn't be thinking, oh, yeah, tithing is great. That's not where Jesus is coming from at all. The problem is we split the little story with she's in it, and we, meaning Catholics, Protestant, yeah. I'm sure, I don't know if Orthodox do it, but Anglicans, they take the story because it's great for, for fundraiser drives. Sure, it makes my heart feel, wow, this old lady showed her true faith by giving her last two pennies. Yeah, yeah. How much better this than that when I write my $100 check, okay? But that's not what in context, the story's about. <clears throat> so the old woman has allowed herself to be taken advantage of by these rapacious manipulators, the temple elites that Jesus was just slamming a moment ago. So when he set, uses her as an example, he's not praising her. He's saying she's foolish. Hmm. And we can know that because the very next verse is he's walking out of the temple and we go right into the synoptic apocalypse where he walks out of the temple and he goes, look at these towers, say one of his followers, a teenager, right? Oh, wow, look how awesome this is. Oh, you think this is awesome? Not one stone is going to be left standing on another. Mm. Wow, that's monstrously cruel if he was praising her a moment ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is he praising her for giving to a, a, a doomed 
building project. Hmm. So when you read it in context, you see that this is, he's not praising the woman. He's saying this, you know, she is, um, she's a victim and, and, and she's allowed herself to be a victim of, 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 of a system that is doomed to die. And tell us the moral lesson that can be given by the, the rich man giving from his wealth and her giving from her poverty. What's the lesson then to be drawn that the traditional concepts and commentaries got wrong? Nobody should be giving to the temple. It's about to be destroyed. Mm. And the reason it's destroyed, according to the evangelists, and this is not, and this can later be taken, unfortunately, for anti-Semitic readings, which right. it's got nothing to do, because by the way, these people are not really Jewish. Uh, yeah, I remember you were talking about that. That's, that, that, that's a whole topic in itself. Right. Let me ask you this, though. Another story you, you referenced in the scriptures um, about another widow right. who, who kept coming to a judge who would not give her justice. He kept annoying him and annoying him and annoying him. He said, fine, woman, he just gives it to her. And right. Jesus says, thus, you should also pray like that. Keep bothering God and he'll give you what you want. Right. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's horrible, right? The way we think how you should, no, no, that's not how we should pray. All right. Talk to us about that. Right. So, so, so it's a less to the more kind of argument, right? So the idea is here we have a shameless judge. Shameless, yeah. right? Shame in the positive sense in the biblical world and the ancient circum Mediterranean Middle Eastern world is a positive shame means you have a sensitivity to honor and safeguarding it. Honor, by the way, is your claim to value and the public's acknowledgement of that claim. Mm -hmm. Shame in the negative sense is uh, uh, is is your honor has been repudiated. Shamelessness would be to repudiate your sense of shame, which is positive shame, the defense of honor. Okay. So this guy's shameless. That means he he's, he doesn't care how other people view him. Mm -hmm. That's an almost an unthinkable concept in this culture, because okay. even the most shameless person actually does care about his honor. And by the way, that's the whole point of the story. Because as she wears him down, he realizes, oh, S-H something T, I'm going to be, I'm gone. I'm going to be destroyed if I don't defend this. And so get her out of here. Just give her what she wants. Let her go. Well, if that's true, peasant audience, if that's true with a shameless judge who's in the pocket of the temple and Jerusalem elites, who's foreclosing on your land, how much more true will it be for the God of Israel, your patron, mm -hmm. your godfather in the sky vault, mm -hmm. who is infinitely sensitive to his honor rating? He defends his honor. And because he's your patron, he will stand with you. Mm. So that's the point of the story. Mm. And so someone shouldn't be banging on the doors of heaven every 10 minutes with the same request over and no, over. No, no. It, means, it means, trust me, if this, if this jerk of a judge will cave what do you think god's gonna do hmm. if you just ask him i have to keep asking him i don't have to keep doing that i don't have to keep asking him it's not like be crazy with god it's more along the lines of asking for a story over and over again when your parent yeah. says no it's, it's, it's if, if if the less situation is true then in with god it's going to be infinitely more true without as much pestering god and That's doing true. that this is good stuff. Yeah. I have I have, I have some other questions here. I want to come down to some of the more um, uh, powerful ones. Uh, let's see. The resurrection? No, we talked about that. Um, altered states of consciousness. I know I want to dive into that with you, but... Maybe here, we can... Yeah. Does it matter if we are unable to distinguish between what is factual and historical or what is theologically invented by the biblical writers? Because you indicated the story of Jesus' youth is yeah. in that tradition to always go back and harken back onto and create a story that would justify the existence of the hero later. That's how they wrote back in the, the, the history. The, the childhood of a hero was always something invented after his heroic death. So then, right, right. They cared about recording it while it was going on. Yeah, Hercules and others, yeah. Right. Are you unable, how are we able then to distinguish between factual historical references in the scriptures, whether New Testament or Old, from theological inventions of the writers with to make great difficulty with great difficulty um and scholarly criteria that have been invented that help us arrive at it uh with sometimes with moral certitude moral but not 
metaphysical certitude. It's 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 hard. It's difficult. We'd have to take the individual things. I would say for some of the things are more important than others. Making this distinction, like what day did Jesus die, die on? on? I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna. Say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. It. I was gonna say, what day did Jesus die on? So Does that bad. really matter? Did he die on Passover day? He died around Passover time, probably thirty common era. Okay. Did he die on the actual day of Passover? Synoptics. Or did he die the day before the, the, the Passover feast, John? That doesn't really matter for, 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 does it really, am I going to really say, well, that matters. That I, but is he the lamb of God? And what does lamb of God mean? Well, mm. That mm. matters a whole lot more. Okay. Well, people like Bart Urban, are you familiar with his writings? And others would say, wait, wait a minute. If there's these incongruities or contradictions or problems in this, in the text, it's evidence that this actually inspired. Obviously, I love, not. I love Bart Ehrman. I love Bart. Yeah, uh, really? he's a scratch. You know what you say, right? The scratch off atheist to the scratch off fundamentalist. The the distance is very brief. Uh, he's he's, uh, of course, for Bart in his personal life. That's his personal journey. Right. It, it is. It is, it is, it is. Look at where the culture Bart Ehrman comes from. It's the same one as Ricky Gervais and 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 Stephen Colbert. Hmm. They're, they're not that distant from each other. Hmm. Now, with some work and some falling on our faces, by the way, I want to give him a great deal of credit here because he will admit that there are biblical scholars. And by scholars, he's talking about critical scholars. He's not just talking about anybody who has a PhD. Right. Critical scholars published and uh, exegetes who publish with recognized journals who go through the gauntlet of peer review and so forth. And okay. So of those scholars, critical scholars of whatever their tradition, whether they're atheist or theist or Christian or not or whatever, there are people who are believing Christians. And he will tell you straight up, those are people who have reasons to believe that I don't have. And those reasons to believe, I would wager, are similar to the when I talked about the reasons to believe that when I talked about that nexus, that web of right. antecedent probabilities that enable me to keep diving into faith. And that's more than, well, you know, Ravi, uh, Ravi Zacharias and William Lane Craig and Scott Hahn and Catholic Answers lining everything up and we can all prove all of it right to the baptismal font. And by the way, in violation of the Second Council of Orange in semi-Pelagianism. You know, I, I, you and I have reasons that we've been impacted by the risen life of Jesus. I mean, I love C.S. Lewis when he says what he says about Tosh. Mm. And mm. how people in other traditions, I would go further than C.S. Lewis. I would say God is in all those traditions too. And I'm not, I'm not a syncretist. No, no, that, that's a good one. Maybe we should we should cap on that one a little bit. The, the Tosh story in the Chronicles of Narnia. Can you spend that? I mean, he's very ever... platonic. He's very platonic. Okay. Uh, C.S. Lewis. Hard not to love C.S. Lewis. I, mean, yeah. I Number love Chesterton too. Despite his uh, author in the 21st century. So, I mean, grief observe. I mean, anybody who's 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 tasted suffering and and hurt and 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 walks with that. I mean, that's that's. That's beautiful. Hmm. But he's an academic like Tolkien, right? He's not quite like G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton has, pro they're all messy. Okay, all of them are messy, right? right. Um, but when he talks about how there are many who call Tosh Aslan, right? And Aslan Tosh, I mean, it. you had the wrong name for it. But for but, those who don't know Aslan or Tosh, can you... Like give a Tosh little is right, like the, the false god in the, in the end of his Chronicles of Narnia. Tosh, of course, is the false lion. He's not the true lion. He's the devil, basically. Yes. It's Antichrist. Right. Because, I mean, this is an allegory. The Chronicles of Narnia, for those who haven't read it, right? I, and it's why Tolkien had problems with it. He didn't like, he liked myth. And I, I prefer myth to um, Star Wars and right. you know, Lord of the Rings. Um, but I love C.S. Lewis. I love the Chronicles of Narnia, too. So, Anyway, that's an allegory. So this means that, you know, whenever you, you figure out what this symbol means, once you once you realize that Aslan is Jesus, you can almost like set Aslan aside. Right. And you know we're talking about Jesus. Uh -huh. Okay. 
So when you do that, you can kind of go through the stories and each thing really represents this thing. Okay. So Tosh is kind of like the devil, kind of like the spirit of Antichrist. Mm-hmm. And there are people, and it can also mean other religious uh, names for God, other traditions and things that are not Christian, and perhaps even sometimes anti-Christian. Okay. But the adherents of those faiths through no fault of their own are actually touched and shaped by God. They didn't even know it. Mm. Mm. And so in the story God of Todd, calls them his own. Okay. Aslan the lion still brings them close and they are saved. In the final well, there's story. people who, okay, who are worshiping Tosh, but that story unfolds in a powerful theological um, uh, climax that Lewis That's talks right. about where, where Aslan says something there. You, you want to uh, unpack that a little bit? I was just, just to say that, that, and I would go a little bit further. I would say that, that um, I don't think it's black and white like that. I think, I think life is, and this is also a fault I have with like Tolkien's. It's 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 a little bit uh, Manichaean. So you've got you know the Justice League racing against the Legion of Doom. Okay, that works great in the Saturday morning cartoon. All right, right. With Skeletor right. And All right. that that's great. But in reality, that's life is is a little bit more messier than that, and a little bit more complicated. I'm not mm-hmm. saying there isn't object evil in the world. Of course there is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I don't doubt that, you know, and if I doubt that, I'm crazy. But so I would go further and say, whenever we reach out to truth, life, goodness, beauty, we are reaching out to the triune life. And we're doing it because the triune life is already the a priori of all things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's grace. That nature is already graced existence. Okay. So I don't have in my, this is where my Catholicism is speaking out here. I have an understanding that, 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 and shaped by my experience too. And I've been through some things, but I don't see f- human beings as fundamentally uh, evil. I don't see that. I don't think, I don't want to distort Calvinist tradition or other Protestants and often get uh, slandered this way. I don't think they think that either. But I, I, I don't have a, a notion of a depraved human existence. I have, an exist, I have a notion that human existence is broken, is hurt, is marked by sin. But that sin isn't the final word, and and I don't think Christians who do believe in total depravity or profess it, and however they mean it, mean that also. I'm just saying that for me, the fundamental original innocence and the original grace of God's existence in all things uh, is more resounding than the brokenness and inauthenticity that is sin, mm-hmm. while real. Mm-hmm. Very real, right? Right. So and, yeah. Oh. Go, I want to just bring us back. I have a couple more, some more questions for you. I want to talk more about the Tosh thing. Um, when uh, when Aslan is approached and told that he was he wasn't worshipped, he wasn't the right one. They they were worshiping Tosh. He says, "Oh no, 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 who you thought you were worshiping was actually me." Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. 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 Uh, I that. I many people that. who may worship other gods or other beings or other ideologies may not know that they're actually worshiping Christ behind behind that god. Behind yeah. that. Um, is is a is a it's a tricky theological uh, conundrum. Um, yeah, I don't want to take take away from norm the importance of normative theological or dogma or or yeah. creedal stuff. Okay, uh, say that that's un- unimportant. We can it's just as good as any other statement. I love God. I like Coke. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Um, but we can also turn that on its head too. To us, okay, you're all professing Christ, but what do I mean by Christ? Mm. I mean, my culturally congenial identity theft of Christ, the intellectual sage, or the great, uh, the, 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 the powerful leader, mm. or the social justice warrior, mm-hmm. or Jesus, the American buddy, or the devotional alien kitsch, alien life form that mm. you see in holy cards. I mean, what are we what those who are in the tent where we think we're all safe what are we who are we worshiping and we have to always be open to the understanding that a child everybody has to begin at a childish point in their relationship with anything including god but this the danger is not that's not what i'm knocking what i'm knocking is or saying is dangerous is to remain in that way 
Mm. And if you have the means, and this is where I think also the practical and the importance of getting to understanding the cultural background of scripture is important. Because if I think scripture is important as a Christian, however I, I mean that, uh, then understanding what it's actually saying is very important. If I'm Joan of Arc living huh. on, on a peasant land, I have no means to understand it except how I am. Okay, God's going to meet her where she's at. But that's not where I'm not on that farm. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a black. That's what you're saying. The first empire assumes he can understand it, and it's obviously as he sees it. <laughs> um, but that's, that's not. Can we actually understand and read the Bible or the ancient scriptures per se, or Old New Testament, and even the Church Fathers, two thousand years removed, and actually come to a conclusion that we can build a doctrine or a catechism or a belief system that we can pass on to our children that's life-changing and built. But Western culture has been built on a lot of the traditions within Christendom. I don't want to get rid of our history either. I think every part of those steps and all those falling down on our faces that our ancestors in the faith, all the steps in between scripture and now, the fathers of the church and all that, and beyond that are important steps. And they're part of the treasury. They're part of the tradition. Um, but I would say yes, with great difficulty. And, and not, no, if we don't do it together. Okay. If, if we want to understand scripture, the starting point, not the finish, is getting to understand Mediterranean and Middle Eastern culture. It's the first word. It's not the last word. It's not the only word. And, and to understand that, to understand what the authors are actually trying to say is fundamental and something we all, whether we're believers or not, should be able to come to together and agree on the spiritual meanings of it okay that's something held in our tradition it's not unimportant the allegorical the the moral moral the anagogical those senses of scripture are important but the first sense has to be what the author was actually trying to say hmm. we can't can, spiritualize that we, away we can get to that is what you're we saying. can get to that just with difficulty yeah. with difficulty <laughs> and not alone that's why we need tradition. That's why we need scholars. That's why we need people. We can't just come up to it with me and my cigarette at a camp somewhere. Amen. Uh, a Bible, right? Amen. And uh, I think we also need other cultures that are that are scholars. So, like, there are things that African scholars can understand about Jesus that we miss as people like me, as as American. And when their Jesus sounds too Nigerian or or too uh, Burundian or or you know. Or to South African or whatever, um, then the American and the Chinese and the Russian can also, in scholarship, go, wait a minute, I don't know about that. So we have to come together to get to the literal sense. And I think that's an international and intercultural. Uh, We're not lost at sea because you do embrace uh, the mystical qualities of the, the, the living spirit of God and the Amen. living word actually working through us and by us and in us to, to transform. Right. The it's Just, not a dead letter. We have to have the spirit. Amen. Yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. into the spiritual senses of scripture, how this points to Christ. If I'm with an atheist who's a scholar, like Bart Ehrman, there are, like, we should be able to agree on a lot of things about what these texts are saying. I think the majority of his um, presuppositions um, are problematic, but his facts, I can't deny the facts that he presents. Historical scholars, he comes from the same tradition. He's right. just putting out things that Christians maybe are embarrassed about or but don't want to express between the Texas Receptus and the other problems that we had trying to explain the, the synoptics between others. Um, but let me um, let me let me try to land this plane here, Bill. Uh, any um, any final words for people who are struggling with their faith, who are watching your videos and say, "Wait a minute, this is actually causing me to doubt my tradition, doubt the Bible, doubt God." Um, what do you say to those people, or how would you encourage them? or equip them to deal with those things? So the first thing, honestly, I would say is that I'm, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm humbled. I can't do anything to destroy or create faith. That comes from God. I'm a fellow dying inmate. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of crazy ideas himself. And I need you to grapple with me. One. Two, we're not talking about, uh, usually in Bible Live presentations, what we're getting into is the literal sense. Mm. 
So I'm not asking people to commit faith wise to this. I'm asking us to see about the reasonableness of what the text is saying in the literal sense. That is what the, the human authors mean that were meant to convey and who they were communicating to. And that, that is the first level or the, that is the, the first meaning, not the last and not the final meaning. I'm not a pope or a bishop or a prophet. I'm not claiming to be any of these things. Okay. Uh, it has enriched my faith. It continues to. To understand that the prefix in of incarnation and inspiration is messy business because I'm messy. Mm. I'm broken and uh, limited and mortal. And yet there's love in my life. There's healing that's real. Christ is real. When I'm alone, I'm not lonely because I'm never really alone. Mm. And I have a tradition that does for all its failings, for all the problems in, in, in the Christian communities. And I've never met a perfect one, including the Catholic Church. In the Archdiocese of Miami, let me tell you, come, come visit. <laughs> You'll see. It's, it's a messy mess, but that's all right. Because we are, uh, you know, Christ can be found in that. Mm. So the that that's what I would I would maybe offer as a direction that I'm not well, I'm not I can't really I can't create your faith or destroy your faith. So I'm not God. Mm. So your faith isn't being hurt. I would I would I would I would challenge you to look at maybe you've confused faith with your beliefs which are an outcome of theology, good or bad. Oh, they're belief in God. They're, too, they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Yeah. There's imprimis, devimus, distinguari. We have to make distinctions. So, so there's a relationship between beliefs. And by the way, there's the belief of the church, like the church believes in hell, mm -hmm. the existence of hell. Yeah. By the way, is that hell is a possibility or hell is an actual reality where there's actual people there? Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's a possibility for sure. And there's, is that hell as it's popularly imagined? Like a Halloween thing with like gasoline all over the place and ah, the nervous system, I guess, being recreated over and over again to be burned again. What do we mean by that? So, so, so there's beliefs and then there's the official beliefs of our Christian community in, in dialogue with the scriptures, the fathers of our faith and so forth in a living tradition that we believe the spirit is connecting us all to. And, and, and am, I, am I in fear about losing my faith when, it, when I really maybe didn't have faith to begin with? Mm. Is it so fragile that somebody like this joker can hurt your faith? Mm. Can hurt your faith. Mm. I can challenge, if I'm doing my job, our beliefs, mm -hmm. like the way a goldsmith, and that's nothing to be worried about. That that's what we all need. So if we can do that in dialogue, I sure need it. Right, I would yeah. say something like that. We we'll knock out everything that's not faith in there. Right, yeah, yeah good one. Okay, let me let me conclude then with a final question, and this comes from the Gospels, where where um, uh, little children are brought to Jesus. And I think you had a video on that one too. I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, where he says, unless you come to me as little children, you can no wise enter the kingdom of God, for such is the kingdom. And don't restrict those. And that has something to do with faith. And I know you could get into the historical right. um, Middle Eastern context of that. But approaching faith and approaching it with an intellectual curiosity, learning the context, learning the um, the, 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 the geopolitical situation of a, a situ uh, what's happening in the writings, that's important. But there's also that childlike faith that's important to come right you are humble and approach it contrast those for us and wrap it wrap it up like tie it up yeah right right okay let's see we'll do this real fast all right so real good oh, you have to be fast i'm saying just wrap so, it up those two contrasting ideas that we, we've been grappling with this whole time faith in the bible is more like godfather style loyalty than it is beliefs mm. So think about the Godfather movies and the loyalty that the familia needs, okay? Corleone, Don Corleone. Don Corleone. And who's more loyal than absolutely dependent children who look up to the patron and the grandfather, the Don, and the whole family, and the adults 
Mm. The most dependent Middle Eastern Mediterranean, circum Mediterranean reality where everybody's an alter ego of each other. I um, remember when my grandfather would walk in and everybody would stand up immediately. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't just say, hey, face to no, face, no, face no, to no, face. Face. Amen. Yeah. How different from our society, which is face to space. There's the president on the TV screen. This is this is how like the Godfather's wedding, and that's a beautiful thing from your culture. It's so beautiful, right? The paterfamilia, right? That's like that's like Abba. So then, when we see it like that, right? Faith is the faith of the loyalty of a child, absolutely undying loyalty, and absolute dependence on 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 his identity and her identity existence in that relational setting. Okay. Um. Faith for us, childlike, not childish. Mm. I think this is the key distinction. We are all to have childlike faith, that kind of loyalty, that kind of wonder that asks questions, never is afraid to ask questions, even if it sounds annoying and the parent wants to shut us up, <laughs> do something, go to sleep. But yeah. we never, because we're hungry. That's a childlike faith. That's what we all are called to have. Right. Childish beliefs. It's my way. This is the right way. You're wrong. Uh, I want it this way, like Veronica Salt in uh, uh, Willy Wonka. Mm. That's childish beliefs. <laughs> you know, if, uh, you know, uh, they better recast Kang because I don't want Dr. Doom coming into this thing right now, you know, of the Marvel comics. I love the Marvel comics. Dr. Well, Doom, you, one you of my gotta talk. Hmm? Yeah. He's actually one of my favorite characters. Oh, Victor, me too. Victor, Victor Vaughn. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, so faith, belief, uh, childish beliefs, uh, those need to go. You got to put the things of the child away, says St. Paul. The black Child. and white. Black and white thinking, stinking thinking. This is the thinking of addicts. Mm. The thinking of, uh, right. Uh, instead, a childlike faith where there's always more I don't know. There's always the next adventure, and I'm. I, I there's so much to enjoy in God's kingdom, and there's so much to suffer through and things like that. But I'm always open to understanding, and I trust in the Lord. I trust in the family. I trust in that. That is, uh, I think, yeah. We need to, we need to cultivate a childlike faith and and get rid of childish beliefs. Well and said. It's a lifelong job. Yeah, yeah. I, I always want to hold on to the fact that my faith is grounded in the dynamic living incarnate person, not a, a book or a tradition or a, a, a catechism or a, a, doctr a doctrine or anything else. It's in a living person who said, follow me, not follow these rules. Me is live. Professor. It's amazing. It's just, yeah, it humbles me and, and awes me at the same time. This has been very enriching for me tonight, sir. Thank you very much. You helped me... Um see my thoughts and, yeah. and I get to learn from you too. And this is one, one to learn together. And that's a very yeah. beautiful way you put it. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And it's wonderful to have you. It's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Same. One moment.